Hello and welcome everybody to another edition of the Saturdays with the Byzantines podcast. My name is Professor Wren, I am your host, and it is good to be back doing another lecture. Now, where we left off before, we were um, just about to jump into uh, a guy who I think is probably the most underrated of the Byzantine emperors, and that is Emperor Alexius Menenus. Uh, he comes to be the Byzantine Emperor soon after the Battle of Manzikert, which was the last thing that we covered here on this show. And so uh, uh, Emperor Alexius is going to be the subject of today's lecture. Uh, we do have a really, really good primary source on him. Uh, Alexius Comnenus' daughter, Anna Comnena, uh wrote a history of him during her exile, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. Uh, but the version we're using here is the Penguin uh, classic edition. Maybe I should do that here because the microphone's right. The microphone is right there. Uh, but this is the Penguin Classic Edition of the Alexiad, which uh, she named after. Uh, she named the book after her father. It's a history of kind of her, her family's uh, rise to power there in the Byzantine Empire. Although they had been powerful before that, but I mean, rising. You know, because having a member of your family become the emperor is is significantly different. I'm going to move this lamp. To get the light a little better. That's better. That's better. Okay. Uh, as I said before, I'm here in a new. Uh, I'm I'm in a new apartment, uh, as you can see by the background. Hopefully, you can't hear the fan. I have the air conditioner back there turned on to the fan. It doesn't look like it's picking up any noise through the microphone. I'm still using the same blue uh, uh, blue snowball. I believe it's called. Yeah, blue snowball microphone. Although now I'm using uh, a, a Logitech. Uh, 1080p uh, HD webcam, uh, so hopefully we get a little bit better video quality. Part of the reason I stopped doing the video portion of the podcast in the past was that uh, I didn't like the, the camera quality of the, I was just using the webcam on my Mac, and so I don't necessarily, I'm hoping that the video quality is a little better. I think it, I think it looks better, so, and hopefully you guys will agree. Just let me know down in the comments uh, if you think the video quality is better, worse, no different drinking out of my uh, Texas mug here, which I got. My cousin got married back in, uh, in June in Austin, Texas. And so I got this while we were down there. And as you can see, there's a little something written on the bottom when I drink out of it. I can't put it in the dishwasher. My, one of my sisters had to write that uh, on the bottom because people kept putting it in the dishwasher, even though it was not dishwasher safe. But anyway. Uh, if you've made it this far in the video, please make sure to give it a like, subscribe to the channel if you are new, and gently tap the notification bell so you never miss another episode. I'm really hoping because, like I said, like I said in my return episode, uh, the the podcast did grow a lot, especially the YouTube channel did a lot. It grew a lot while I was gone, uh, and so I'm hoping that now that I'm gonna hopefully get back to posting regularly, uh, the the growth will really pick up because if it grew while I wasn't posting, I'm imagining that it's going to grow a good amount now that I am posting. But anyway, so let's jump right into, like I said, Alexius Comnenus, I think probably pro easily the most underrated Byzantine emperor, uh, really I think needs to be put in a category of some of the greatest Roman emperors going all the way back to even uh, the Emperor Augustus because the situation that Alexius Comnenus inherits is so bad. Uh, the empire is really on the brink of collapse. And not only does the empire survive under his reign, but it actually grows and expands and is in a more stable position under his reign, uh, which I think is really, really impressive. You really need to consider the situation that the emperor has when he inherits uh, the throne, uh, uh, and then what it's like when he's when he's done. So Alexius Comnenus was born in either 1057 or 1056 AD. Uh, they're not really sure exactly what year he's born, and then he reigns until uh, front, he, he ascends the throne in 1081, and then he dies in 1118. So he's on the throne for 37 years, which is a really long, that's, that's a sign of really good stability. Uh, someone's on the, on the you know, throne for almost four decades. That shows a great deal of stability, real uh, uh, ability to um, avoid palace coups and that sort of thing, and to foil any sort of uh, uh, attempt to overthrow him. Alexius was the son of the domestic of schools, or the Stoli. Uh, his father's name was John Comenus, but don't let that name fool you. Uh, the domestic of the schools 
was a military post in command of elite units. It is not a school administrator. You will not find a domestic schools anywhere on your local school board or in the Department of Education. And Alexius Comnenus proves himself. He rises through the ranks of the military as a commander. Uh, he serves uh, in the Byzantine army. Uh, uh, he fights against the Turks at Manzikert. Uh, don't know exactly how much of a uh, feather in your cap that is, considering how much of a disastrous defeat that was. You can go back and watch we did, uh, the, last, the, la <clears throat> the last lecture I did, the last main lecture I did was on the Battle of Manzikert. Uh, and again, uh, he also served, uh, Alexius was a commander against a number of rebels in the western part of the Byzantine Empire, which earned himself the post of commander of the field army there in the west for the Byzantines. Uh, a little background on the, our author, again, Anna Canetta, we are using the, hold my zoom here, we're using the uh, Penguin Classic, Alexia by Anna Canetta. Uh, I'm not sure who the translator was on this. Let me, let me see if I can. Translated by E.R.A. Stewart. That is the uh, that is the translator of this particular copy. Uh, I really like Penguin Classics. I, I just like I don't know the, the cover art they do, and the, they're very they're very sturdy. They hold up. This was used. I bought this used in college, uh, and it's held up quite well. Uh, but so a little background on the author Anna Kamena was the daughter of Alexius Kamenas and his wife Irene Dukas. Uh, the Dukas family is another uh, important uh, noble family there in the Byzantine Empire at this point in time. They'll come up more in the future uh, as we move through this little lecture series here. Now, Anna had a brother named John who was appointed by his father, kind of picked as the heir uh, to Alexius when uh, he would die. However, Anna and her husband, a guy named Nicephorus, both conspired to kick John off the throne after. Alexios had died uh, because Anna thought that her brother was a bit incompetent and that her husband would be better off, uh, would serve the empire better as emperor. However, their plot was foiled and they were both tonsured and uh, sent to live in monasteries for the rest of their lives. And it is while she's living in, I guess you would really properly say a convent for Anna, uh, convent, that's, where the, that's where the nuns live, and she's a woman, so. Uh, but it is while she is uh, basically banished in a convent where Anna writes the Alexiad, which obviously she names after her father, who she clearly had a great amount of love and respect for. Uh, uh, you, can you can really tell the way that she talks about her dad in, in the book that she thinks very, very highly of him. She loves her dad a lot. Uh, because she has nothing but glowing things to say about her father. Now, <clears throat> Alexius Comnenus comes to the throne when him and his brother, uh, who goes by the name of Isaac, overthrew the emperor Nicephorus III. And interestingly enough, uh, Anna, Anna tells us in the Alexiad that her father was very distraught because when, uh, when he overthrew Nicephorus III, uh, uh, his army comes into Constantinople, they overthrow the emperor, and then his, the army which he's commanding uh, goes through and uh, ransacks Constantinople uh, during this whole process. And it says that he, uh, Alexius, had a great amount of guilt about, about this whole thing, about the ransacking of the city. Um, I'll read you a little excerpt here of what Anna has to say about it. Uh, and he even does, he does amount a good, good amount of prayer, fasting, and at one point he's even sleeping on the floor. So, We'll be reading here again. This is from uh, book three, and this is page 89. So distraught with these reflections and deeply perturbed, Alexios feared that somehow he might be the scapegoat, the object of God's vengeance. He regarded the evil which had befallen the whole city as his responsibility, even if he was really, sorry, even if it was really the work of individual soldiers, all that rabble that descended in a mighty flood uh, on all parts of Constantinople. He was sick at heart, filled with shame, as if he personally had committed these frightful atrocities. I'll just move on a little here. Uh, she says that churches, sanctuaries, property, both public and private, all were victims of the universal pillage. 
it says, uh, she goes on, reflecting on this, Alexia suffered pangs of remorse and a grief beyond endurance. He was extremely sensitive at all times to wrongdoing and thought that he was, uh, sorry, and thought he was aware of, sorry, though he was aware that these crimes against the city were the work of the hands of others. Uh, she continues on here, but even so, he assumed the whole burden of guilt and was anxious and willing to heal the wounds, for only thus, after healing and cleansing, could he approach the task of governing the empire or satisfactorily direct and bring to a proper conclusion his plans for the army and its wars. Uh, I'm kind of skipping around here. Um, And we'll, uh, uh, yeah, so as, as we go on here, this is continuing on page 91. The palace became a scene of fearful lamentation, not, in, not insincere or a sign of any faint heartedness, but rather praiseworthy and the per persecutor of a high everlasting joy. It was typical of the emperor's own piety that he should inflict on himself a penalty further. For 40 days and nights, he wore sackcloth beneath the royal purple and next to his skin, which I have to imagine caused a lot of chafing. Uh, hopefully not too much bleeding. At night, he slept on bare ground with his head uh, supported on nothing more than a stone while he bewailed his sins. And it was only, uh, sorry, as, would, as was only right. Thereafter, when the penance was completed, he turned his attention to the administration of the empire with clean hands. So there you can see uh, Anna uh, really showing us the, the kind of, uh, uh, I guess you could say, sensitive nature of, his, of her father. Because, and, and you know, ultimately, it is, it is good for a leader to have this mentality because obviously he can't control every single person in his army. However, the buck does stop with him. The buck does stop with the emperor, right? And so because of that, you know, he does need to assume some responsibility for, for the things that, <clears throat> that people under his command are doing, even if he might not have a lot of necessarily direct control over them. Uh, uh, and it's a, good, it's a good public image, right? It's good for people to see that uh, uh, the emperor is really taking responsibility for everything that goes on under his watch. Uh, it's gonna, people are going to respect you more if, if they see that you're, you're taking that kind of responsibility. Uh, <clears throat> so moving on here. The reign of Alexius Comnenus was characterized, characterized uh, by constant threat. The, the Byzantine Emperor Empire is under threat really in all directions, coming uh, from the west. Or this, this would be my, I'm, so I'm assuming this is your left, so it's my right. But So coming from the west from the Normans, from the east from the Turks, and then from the north from groups like the Pechenegs, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, so for, and this is part of the reason why I consider Alexius Comnenus to be the last great uh, Byzantine Empire emperor, because uh, he leads the empire through a number of difficult times, invasions, he has to guide them through the crusade, but through all this chaos and through all these, you know, uh, uh, precarious moments, uh, the Byzantine Empire actually comes out looking better uh, uh, once Alexius is done with this reign than it does when, when he starts out and he has to go through a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations, a lot of difficult uh, situations, and they come out looking, looking better than they did before, which is why, like I said, I think Alexius from Venice has to be considered one of the great Roman emperors because, because of the way he handles a very, very difficult situation. And so in his early years, he saw a lot of conflicts uh, and two of those main, two of the main groups, or really three of the main groups, I should say, uh, uh, there's conflicts with the Normans, there's conflicts with the Pechenegs, who are a semi-nomadic uh, Turkic group that comes out of Central Asia, uh, uh, approaching the Byzantine Emperor, Empire from the north, crossing the Danube River, and then as well also the Turks, the constant threat of the Turks uh, uh, coming from the, from the east. At this point in time, the threat really has shifted from Arab Muslims to, uh, uh, at this point in time, it's uh, Salyut, Turkish uh, Muslims. And then as we know, later on, the threat will shift from uh, Seljuk Turks to Ottoman Turks. But to give you a little idea here, 
<clears throat> uh, taking again, this is from book three of Anna Kamenu's Alexiad. Uh, this is uh, a bit on how Alexius uh, went through and determining which which of these threats to handle first, because obviously you can't handle uh, and you can't address all of these threats at once, or at least if you do, you're going to be divided and you're not going to be able to handle them very well. So Alexius wants to be able to devote all of his attention to one threat at a time. So Anna tells us here, Alexius gladly accepted the offer of negotiations. Now she's talking here about the Turks. Uh, he's going to accept kind of a temporary or at least what he knows would be a temporary peace deal with the Turks in the east so that he can uh, handle the threat of attack from the Normans coming in the west. Uh, he had reliable information from many sources about Robert's uh, unlimited ambition, and he knew that enormous forces had been gathered. Robert was already hurrying to uh, the Lombardy coast. After all, Hercules, sorry, if Hercules could not fight, uh, fight two opponents at once, as the proverb says, how much more was it true of a young general who had but recently acquired a corrupt empire, slowly perishing over a long period, and now at its last gasp, without armies and without money. Now, the Robert they're talking about here is uh, Robert Giscard, who uh, was the, uh, really the founder of the Norman kingdom in southern Italy. Now, the Normans, you may be wondering, uh, uh, isn't Normandy up in France? Well, the answer to that, of course, is yes. Now, the Normans, the way the Normans get there, I may have explained this on the podcast before, but the way the Normans get into Normandy is that they're actually a group of Vikings who the king of France, I believe the Viking uh, was named Rollo. I can't remember the name of the king of France. It may have been Tupete, although I, I, I could be getting that wrong. <clears throat> but the king of France offered a duchy to this group of Vikings in order to protect uh, uh, mainland Europe from Viking invasions, because what would happen would be the Vikings would come uh, uh, sail down from Scandinavia, and they'd get into the river systems, and they could sail all the way through uh, the various rivers uh, in what is now France and terrorize really the countryside. And so the king of France decided to better to stop uh, uh, groups of Vikings from invading his kingdom uh, than other Vikings, and so. This group of Vikings was given uh, the Duchy of Normandy, and so they're called Normans. Uh, now, over the years, many Normans traveled uh, through southern Italy on pilgrimages to the Holy Land. And a lot of them took a liking to southern Italy. It's a nice warm climate. You know, you don't have harsh winters. There's a lot of fertile fields down there. Uh, uh, lots of nice uh, vineyards and good wine, right? It's, it's almost like, it's almost like a, a south, the South Florida of... Uh, of Europe, at, at medieval Europe, at least at this point in time. Uh, uh, those of you European viewers may not understand the, the reference to South Florida, but it's, you know, it's, it's nice, it's sunny, it's beautiful, weather is good all year. There's no harsh uh, snow or winter conditions. Although personally, myself, I kind of appreciate a change of seasons. Uh, but there's no accounting for taste. So the Normans uh, uh, kind of continually, continuously having this adventurous uh, spirit, perhaps it's, a, uh, some people attribute this to a, you know, it's a genetic thing, like the Vikings were always adventurous, and so their descendants just kind of continuously have this uh, spirit of adventure, always looking for uh, uh, new new endeavors to take on. And so a group, a group of Normans led by, again, Robert Guiscard, uh, who was a member of the Oakville family, <clears throat> go to southern Italy and carve out a little kingdom for themselves. And this, uh, we may have talked about this before, but the uh, the last of the Byzantine uh, uh, presence in southern Italy was uh, rooted out by the Normans. Uh, and there's also a really good book if you guys are interested in uh, uh, Lars uh, Brownworth, who is a popular uh, historian who's written several several books on uh, medieval uh, history, which uh, I've read the excuse me I've read the book his book on uh, the Normans. It's it's pretty good. Uh, you guys, I would recommend going and picking that up. Uh, he's got a couple other ones. He's got one on the Byzantines, and I think he has one on the Vikings as well. Uh, he's now a PhD professional historian. Uh, he was a high school teacher at a prep school in Long Island. Uh, but you know, I think his work is, it, it's for, 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 for not being a professional historian, it's, I think it's pretty good. 
Now, Robert Guiscard invaded the Byzantine uh, territory. Uh, uh, he crosses over, so he's crossing over from Italy, uh, uh, and he uh, besieges and eventually takes uh, the city of Dyrrhachium, which uh, you may also know as Durazzo, which I believe is in modern day Albania, which uh, he does that in 1081. And then he presses onward into Thessaly. Uh, ultimately, the goal was Constantinople, but he was not able to reach that because uh, Alexius uh, goes and does some the classic uh, Byzantine diplomacy here. Uh, bribes the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV with 360,000 nomismata uh, to invade southern Italy and basically to attack Robert from kind of through his back door. And so he's going to have to leave and go back. And if you're wondering, a nomismata is just a Byzantine uh, coin, it's like a silver coin. Uh, and so when this happens, Robert has to turn around and go back uh, to see the matters there in his kingdom in southern Italy. Uh, if we go here, just a little uh, bit on this. So Alexios, this is again, uh, still from book three on page 101. Alexios knew that the German king was more powerful than all the others. Uh, in the previous paragraph, she, she goes through how Alexios is go, uh, talks to other uh, rulers there in Italy, trying to get them to uh, um, attack Robert Guiscard to, to alleviate the pressure there on the Byzantines in the West. But she says of all of those, because right, the, the German uh, king, who she won't refer to as Holy Roman Empire, Emperor, because obviously the, the Byzantines see themselves as the Romans, uh, but uh, the, whole, the Holy Roman Empire does have holdings in, uh, in Northern Italy. So they do have a base from which to, to fairly easily attack the Normans there in Southern Italy. Uh, and so she goes on the German king, whatever policy he adopted, it would be successful no matter how Robert opposed it. On more than one occasion, therefore, the letters full of conciliatory phrases and all kinds of pledges were dispatched to him. And when he was certain, the king would acquiesce and was prepared to yield to his wishes. Uh, the diplomat they sent once more departed with another message for him. And then she goes on to describe what the message says. Uh, and so this is, this is what uh, gets, um, Uh, gets that front alleviated there for Alexios. And I have to read to, for you a little excerpt here. This is from now uh, when uh, Robert Guiscard uh, uh, invades uh, the Byzantines from on their Western front. Uh, he brings with him his son, uh, Bohemond, uh, you might call him Bohemond of Toronto, uh, Bohemond of uh, Antioch. Uh, he's going to be one of the leaders of the First Crusade there. But there's a scene here, uh, which I think is really funny. It's reminiscent of a Monty Python uh, uh, scene. Uh, you can very easily see this being in a Monty Python, uh, being worked into you know, Holy Grail or something. So this is from page uh, 112. <clears throat> so this is referring to uh, Bohemond uh, has sailed across and is attempting to attack uh, the city of Dyrrhachium, or again, you could also call it, call it Durazzo. It says, day was already breaking when Bohemond arrived and demanded that they should acclaim the emperor and his father. But they made fun of his beard. This is the defenders of Dyrrhachium, right? They make fun of his beard. Unable to bear the insult, Bohemond led the attack on them in person, making for the biggest ships, others following him. The battle was fiercely contested. However, when Bohemond was fighting, with even greater ferocity, they hurled down one of these great blocks of wood, which I mentioned, which I mentioned, from aloft and hold the ship on which he happened to be. The water was sucking the Franks down, and as they were in great danger of being engulfed, some jumped overboard, but found themselves in the exact same situation and were drowned. So I just think that's, I think that's very funny that he's, you know, he's standing there, he's outside the city, he's trying to maintain his composure, right? They've sailed over, they're trying to attack via uh, the sea and the, uh, the defenders of Dyrrhachium are making fun of, <laughs> making fun of Bohem's beard. And uh, this, 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 this is, the, the, that, that's just the last straw 
and and he he you know he has to launch this uh, uh, one might even say uh, ill-fated attack, which which is what it ends up being, because he just couldn't stand the insults to his beard. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, so the Norman threat after you know after that is is taken care of. Now to address the uh, threat of the Pechenegs. So the Pechenegs were a semi-nomadic Turkic people, like I said before, another in a long, long line of Central Asian nomads who uh, migrated across the Eurasian steppe and down into Europe, uh, finding themselves at the banks of the Danube River. Uh, the Pechenegs had allied themselves to a rebel group in Thrace. They were allied to uh, a Paul Paulician group, which is a Christian heretical group. I did a little reading about them last night. Uh, they seem to have, uh, they are uh, adoptionist, meaning that, uh, you know, Jesus adopts, I think, if I'm understanding this correctly, one of his natures, uh, either the human or, or the divine one. Um, they reject the Old Testament. They reject certain books in the New Testament. Uh, they're, they're mostly big into Paul, which uh, some people say is why they're called Paulicians, others that uh, uh, not referring to Paul the Apostle, but another guy named Paul started this uh, kind of heretical sect. But so there's a group of Paulicians living in, in uh, kind of the Balkans or Thrace, and so they ally themselves to the Pechenegs. And in <clears throat> when Alexius goes to put down this group of rebels, uh, he is then later surrounded by the Pechenegs, and he's forced to sign a treaty with them and promise them uh, tribute. And that's in 1087. However, a little while later, Alexius uh, allied himself to a horde of Cumans. Now, uh, Cumans are another uh, nomadic Turkic group, comes from Central Asia, uh, you know, a very uh, horse uh, based, horse archer based army, uh, people, uh, people constantly on the move. Uh, and that's in 1091. And through this alliance, with the Cumans, uh, Alexios came, uh, joins forces with them and neutralizes the threat of the Pechenegs. However, this alliance uh, was somewhat short-lived because in 1094, uh, the same group of Cumans starts raiding through imperial territory there in Thrace and the Balkans. However, this threat is short-lived as the chief of this Cuman horde uh, dies soon after the incursion into imperial territory and the horde essentially uh, dissipates after uh, their chief is dead. And now with the Normans and the Pechenegs uh, neutralized, Alexios can devote most of his attention to the Eastern Front with the Turks, where the Turks had overrun almost the entirety of Asia Minor. If you look, if you look at a, a map, there's a lot of good maps online of um, the Byzantine Empire at the start of the reign of Alexios in 1081, uh, and then uh, what it looks like uh, at the end of his reign. And you can see that the Byzantines had basically lost all of their holdings there in Asia Minor at the start of the reign of Alexios. And by the end of his reign, uh, they, they take over much of, of, of Western Anatolia, which again is very impressive. Now, one of the most notable aspects, uh, uh, especially in reference to uh, the Byzantines' conflicts with the Turks, one of the most notable aspects of Alexius's reign is the inception of the crusader movement. In uh, 1095, excuse me, uh, Alexius sends envoys to the Pope uh, to talk about reconciliation between the Eastern and Western churches. At this point. Obviously after the schism of 1054. Uh, and he also requests military aid from the West to deal with the Seljuk Turks in Asia Minor. Now there are some people who claim that uh, Alexius never asked for large crusader armies to be sent uh, over to him, that he really only wanted you know, some mercenaries, just, a, just a, a supplementary force to the armies he already had. But whether or not that's true, that's what he got. Now, we're only going to, I'm only going to briefly address the crusades here from a Byzantine perspective, because this is a Byzantine podcast. Uh, a podcast series on the crusades from a Western perspective in the future maybe in the works. Again, like I said, we're going to finish this podcast series first and then I'll see then I'll see about it. But I do think that the next, uh, if I do do a, another lecture series, it would be on the Crusades. Uh, 
it's a subject that I really enjoy talking about. And uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in it as well. Uh, Thomas Madden has a really good book uh, called A Concise History of Crusades, which would be our primary text, which by the way, um, funny enough, uh, you're not gonna hear me referencing the Warren Treadwell book a lot here, at least for the next couple of episodes, because uh, I've actually lost my copy of Warren Treadgold's uh, A Concise History of Byzantium. Uh, during, it was lost somewhere in the movie. Uh, I thought it was at my parents' house, and, and I'm not sure exactly where it is. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully we find it, I don't have to buy another copy. But so anyway, at the Council of Claremont in 1095, Pope Urban II calls the First Crusade. And it was a call to all Catholics to take up arms against the Saracens and reclaim the Holy Land for, uh, for Christians, both Eastern and Western Christians. Uh, and the, the idea here as well was that any land that the Crusaders would take would be restored to the Byzantine Empire later on. However, there's mixed results with that. And uh, we'll read a little bit more here about that. Let's look ahead in the, in the text. Here we go. Should have just gone to my sticky note. Uh, this is from book 10, and this is on page, uh, in my copy, it's on page 289. So thus, not long afterwards, Godfrey, and this is a uh, Godfrey of Bouillon, who is one of the three major uh, leaders of the First Crusade. You have Godfrey of Bouillon, Bouillon you have uh, Raymond of Toulouse, and you also have Bohemond, uh, Bohemond of Toronto, Bohemond of Antioch, you know, he goes by different names, but it's Bohemond the son of Robert Guiscard. But anyway, Godfrey submitted to the emperor's will. Uh, he came to the emperor and swore an oath uh, as he was directed that whatever towns, lands, or forts he might in future subdue that had in the first place belonged to the Romans uh, would be handed over to the officer appointed by the emperor for this very purpose. So seemingly uh, the emperor had appointed somebody to go along with the Crusader armies and if the, whatever land or towns that the Crusaders were able to take from the Seleucids at that point would have to be turned over to the Byzantines, which, like I said, has some mixed results. Uh, having taken the oath, he received generous amounts of money and he was invited to share the emperor's hearth and table and was entertained at a magnificent banquet after which he crossed over uh, and pitched camp uh, in, uh, in Asia Minor. And so what we're gonna see happen here is there is, so at the very beginning, uh, when the Crusaders, uh, when the army is all show up in Constantinople, they're first going to cross over with the Byzantines and they do take some land which had been, uh, uh, which had belonged to the Byzantine Empire, most notably the city of Nicaea uh, is taken by a combined Byzantine and Crusader force and uh, there are some instances uh, where the Crusaders are making their way through Western Asia Minor and they win some battles against the Turks, which, and they don't even necessarily turn the land over to the Byzantines, but what happens is now that uh, the Crusaders are kind of moving on down towards Jerusalem, there's a vacuum and the Byzantines are able to come in and fill that vacuum. But really after the taking of Nicaea, uh, any cooperation between the Byzantines and the Turks is or sorry, between the Byzantines and the Crusaders is done. Uh, and in fact, there are many instances, uh, or at least there are some instances, where the Byzantines are actually giving the Turks uh, intelligence on the Crusader armies to tip them off to attack them. Now you might say, why, why are the Byzantines uh, 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 giving information to the enemy here? Uh, why are the Byzantines not helping out the Crusaders? Uh, they should be. They should be allies. They're both Christians. They both have common causes of fighting, fighting the Turks. This should be. This should be an easy alliance. Well, you have to understand this. Uh, I think, especially us as Westerners, we need to kind of take the perspective of the Byzantines here for a second. Now, the Byzantines again. Alexios Comnenus comes to the throne in a completely chaotic situation where there's threats coming at him from all directions, right from the north, from the west, and from the east. Not much of a threat can come from the south because there's just ocean there, right? <clears throat> but so, 
So he, uh, Alexius neutralizes the threat of the Normans, he neutralizes the threat of the Pechenegs, and now he can focus on the threat of the Turks, but now he, has, he also has a threat uh, coming from uh, these Crusaders, from these Normans, and especially when one of the major leaders of the Crusader army is Bohemond of Toronto, who had just invaded him, you know, uh, uh, from the kingdom of the Normans and was leading his army to go take Constantinople, uh, you can understand why the Byzantines are not exactly comfortable with, with these Westerners, with the call them Franks, the call them Latins, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the Byzantines are not really comfortable with these guys marauding through their empire. Byzantines are nervous that uh, uh, the, the Latins, the Westerners are going to take, you know, turn on them, which actually does end up happening in the Fourth Crusade, which we'll certainly talk about a lot here. Um, and we'll see, we'll, I'll read uh, uh, some interesting passages here in a second. But uh, I just want to also reference, you know, uh, the Crusades historian Jonathan Riley Smith, I may be getting the, the, the book and the historian wrong here, but the idea, uh, I, I know I've read it in a book on the Crusades, and I'm pretty sure it's by, it's from Jonathan Riley Smith. I don't have the copy of his book with me, so I apologize if I'm getting uh, this historian wrong. But he, uh, he states that, or wh whoever's idea this is, is that there's a serious divide between Eastern and, Eastern and Western Christians during the Crusades. And it's, it's, a, it's a divide that is really, uh, does not get uh, bridged. And they never come to fully understand each other. And in fact, Western Latin Christians actually come to better understand their Muslim, uh, Turk Mu Turkish Muslim and Arab Muslim foes than they do to come to understand the, uh, uh, their Eastern Christian brother. And of course, the final nail in the coffin for this was the Fourth Crusade. There was some hope at reconciliation and perhaps understanding before the Fourth Crusade and the sack of Constantinople uh, by the Fourth Crusade. But once the, once the Fourth Crusade happens and Constantinople is sacked by a Western Crusader army, any hope at understanding between the two groups and reconciliation between the group, two groups is done. And even uh, uh, Eastern Christians today sometimes have heard uh, when, when there's talks of reconciliation, we'll still mention uh, 1204, which is, which is a disaster in my opinion. The greatest blot, the greatest stain on the Crusader movement was the sack of Constantinople in 1204 uh, because, because it, it uh, makes permanent that divide between, again, Eastern and Western Christendom. Uh, and as well, you know, there is, there is a lot of negative feeling of the Byzantines towards, towards the Westerners. They are very, very culturally snobbish, and especially regarding Bohemond. Anna Kamena cannot reference Bohemond without calling him a liar, a cheat, a loose cannon, like every, every reference to him comes with some sort of gratuitous insult, which I think is, which I think is kind of funny. Um, just the way that she, just the way that she goes about this. I mean, any, you can, you can open up, open this book up to any point where she's talking about him. Um, and there's going to be some sort of gratuitous insult, but I'll just give you a little example here. <clears throat> this is from book, uh, this is from book 10 still. This is on page, in my copy, this is page 294. And so she says, the emperor, who was familiar with the erratic disposition of the Latins, quoted a popular saying, his mischief shall come back to haunt him. Bohemond heard this, and when he saw the servants carefully assembling the presents to carry them away, he changed his mind. Uh, once more, uh, the, the emperor had offered uh, Bohemond gifts when he uh, had arrived with his army to go on the crusade uh, uh, and met up with the emperor in Constantinople. Uh, instead of sending them off in anger, he smiled on them like a chameleon, which transformed itself in a minute. The truth is that Bohemond was a habitual rogue, quick to react to fleeting circumstance. He far surpassed all the Latins who passed through the Roman Empire at that time in his villainy and sheer gall, just as he was outshone by them in wealth and resources. So she's also taking pot shots at him saying that. You know he's the poorest of uh, of the Crusader noblemen who've come through, uh, and that he's you know he's a loose cannon. He's emotional. Uh, he's arrogant. Uh, he was the supreme mischief maker, 
As for all inconsistency, that followed automatically a trait common to all Latins. So you can see here cultural snobbery as well, not just towards Bohemian, but anyone, really anyone who's not Byzantine, anyone who's not Roman, because again, keep in mind, the Byzantines don't call themselves or think of themselves as Byzantines, they think of themselves as Romans. And so they have a really high degree of cultural snobbery and anyone who's not part of their Roman culture, they consider to be a barbarian. And this is, this is fairly common in, in the ancient and medieval world uh, to, for, for many cultures. I think I've mentioned this before, but you know, the Persians uh, uh, thought of anyone who wasn't Persian as barbarian. So it's not, it's not specific unto Romans. Uh, she goes on to say, he was a bitter man, for as he had no inheritance at all to speak of, he had set out from his native land in theory to worship at the Holy Sepulchre. Again, that, so, so she's referencing there the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. But he had really gone to, sorry, he had really done so in order to win power for himself and better, if possible, to seize the Roman Empire for himself, as his father had suggested. So she's saying here that uh, Bohemond's uh, going on crusade is not out of some uh, authentic desire to, to free the Holy Land from the, uh, the Saracens and to worship at the, at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Instead, he's trying to win glory for himself uh, and to uh, seize the Roman Empire, which is a common uh, and often uh, uh, unfounded accusation of crusaders that they were oftentimes looking for uh, uh, not necessarily uh, going on crusade for religious, authentic religious purposes, but in order to win glory and lands and all of those things, you know, dispossessed sons of kings and noblemen uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, Bohemond of Toronto is really one of the few examples that anyone can provide of that. And he doesn't even really stick around in the Holy Land for very long because he's going to go back to uh, the, king, the Norman kingdom in Southern Italy and be fighting the Byzantines actually after the first crusade is over, which is, which is very interesting. Uh, and it does, it does go to show why the Byzantines were very suspicious, especially of a guy like Bohemond in the first place. But so ultimately, uh, Alexius Comnenus's, sorry, Alexius Comnenus's uh, legacy, it ultimately I think is a really great one. He inherits an empire that is on the verge of collapse and he's facing threats from all, again, all directions. Uh, <clears throat> and using sometimes famed Byzantine diplomacy and cunning on the battlefield, Alexius managed to both hold on to the empire, keep it alive and expand it again. Uh, uh, I don't have the visual image with me, but if you Google uh, Byzantine Empire at the beginning and the end of the reign of Alexius Comnenus, you'll see you'll see that it uh, uh, expands by a good amount, which is a halt, which is a mark of a very successful reign, along with him being on the throne for 37 years. Uh, when he comes to the throne, the Byzantines had lost almost all of their holdings in Asia Minor, and when he dies, when Alexius dies. Uh, the western half of Anatolia, along with much of the northern Anatolian coast, is back in the Byzantine East hands. Uh, the threat of the Normans is essentially neutralized as well, though the Byzantines, like I said, have to fight Bohemond and the Normans a second time after the First Crusade is over. And although there would be turmoil regarding the succession of uh, Alexius after his death, which I mentioned before with Anna Comnenus and her husband attempting to uh, overthrow Anna's brother John, uh, that is not something that Alexius could control after he's dead because he's dead. Uh, still, perhaps his greatest mistake might have been not leaving a strong and clear successor, although you have to say uh, he does have a successor in mind, it just doesn't work. So that's our lecture today on Alexius Comnenus. I hope you guys found it interesting. Uh, I, really, I really think, like I said, he's the last great Byzantine emperor. He's the last great Roman emperor. I think he is an admirable character given, given all of the circumstances. So if you made it this far into the lecture, please make sure to give, give this a like and subscribe to the channel if you're new and hit the notification bell so you never miss another episode. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Google Play, please make sure to give us a follow on there and a five-star review. Uh, you can find us on Instagram at Professor Ren if you want to interact with me there or leave a comment in the YouTube video. That is usually the best way to, to talk to me and interact with me. Uh, so that's all I have for you guys this time. I uh, hope you've enjoyed, and I'll see you all next time.